Hey everybody, welcome to Non-Trivial. If you are on the uh, video format, so you're watching me right now, you can see in the upper corner what I'm talking about. If you're in the audio only podcast, you're only listening to me, I'll just describe what it is I am talking about. It's a plot, it's data. It's got an x-axis, a y-axis, so a usual kind of scientific linear regression type plot. You got a bunch of data in the middle and you got a trend line going across it, across that data to show that there is a trend. Okay, so this is something that was posted on X, right? Formerly Twitter. Doesn't matter who it is. I'm not really interested in the people. It's the ideas that matter, right? So what this poster said in the tweet or the X post is, can you predict IQ based on grades? One meta-analysis suggests the answer is yes. It found that the correlation between IQ and grades was 0.54, and that means a scatter plot of the data would look like this. Okay. So my issue here, and I have all kinds of issues with uh, with IQ research, with proponents of IQ, it's, it's by any objective notion of how science is supposed to work, absolute pseudoscientific nonsense. Okay. It's, it's doesn't correspond to what it means to measure in science. It, it does not fit to any notion of uh, how to model complex systems or situations and on and on. And there's many ways that we could pick this apart, whether it's going after a study like this itself or just the broader kind of implications of what IQ means. And I'll talk a bit about that later. And other people have you know debunked IQ at length and, and all that. But let's just look at this post because it touches on something that's really problematic in, uh, in studies like this. Okay. So let's just look at that first line and we'll go to the study directly in a second, but let's, let's just deal with the post first. Can you predict IQ based on grades? Well, yes. If someone is good at passing academic tests, like IQ tests, they will be good at passing academic tests, like what you would see scholastically, what you would see in school. Okay. So this is the problem with a lot of IQ research is that really all of it stems from a deeply flawed argument. Okay, a fallacious argument. This is a fallacy. This is circular reasoning. No matter how you word it, if you say something like, can you predict IQ based on grades? Or can you predict the scholastic outcome based on IQ or some version of this? You are doing circular reasoning because you're saying, can you predict IQ, the ability to pass a test well, based on grades, which is the ability to pass a test well. It's like saying, look what, re- look what statistics or research or science was able to find. Believe it or not, if you're good at passing tests, it turns out you're good at passing tests. This is how you know, ridiculous and deeply flawed that statement is. And, and so what I'm going to talk about in this episode is that any research that goes off from this point, no matter what statistics you use, mathematics, probability, anything in your scientific toolbox, it doesn't matter because the logic itself is deeply flawed. You can't go from flawed logic to something better using statistics. You have to, at very least, get the statistics right, or sorry, the logic right. That's your foundation because it's based on reasoning. Right? So this is the problem with IQ research is it's very circular. It, it assumes that right off the bat that IQ is actually measuring intelligence, which is a, a, a very problematic statement. and loaded with assumption and baked in implicit premises to the arguments that get made. Okay. So, so we'll get into that. Now, first of all, this chart that we're looking at, if you're on the video version, isn't even from the study, which kind of says something right there. Why would you not show something from the study itself? They're actually redrawing an image now. You know, maybe you could kind of justify that. Maybe that's just a way to better depict the correlation. Maybe it's somewhat akin to what physicists do in theoretical physics. If you can't see a black hole directly, then we'll get an artist to depict what a black hole might look like. Something kind of like that, even though now apparently we can see black holes, right? Okay, so so the, this is the actual paper. If you're watching me right now, you can see the title there, but it's, it's called Intelligence and School Grades, a Meta-Analysis. Um, let me just read the abstract of the paper first, uh, or at least part of it, because it is a real study. It is real data. There's nothing being faked here in that sense. Okay. We're, we're, so I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. So the, the abstract of the paper reads, intelligence is considered as the strongest predictor of scholastic achievement. 
Research, as well as educational policy, and the society as society as a whole are deeply interested in its role as a prerequisite for scholastic success. The present study investigated the population correlation between standardized intelligence tests and school grades, employing psychometric meta-analysis. The analysis involved 240 independent samples and 105,185 participants, and on and on. They corrected for sampling error, error of measurement, and range restriction, which just have to do with how representative how representative your study actually is relative to the real or whole population. Okay. Um, so let's just pick this apart a little bit without even getting into the paper. If you look at an abstract like that, there's something deeply problematic right off the bat. Intelligence is considered as the strongest predictor of scholastic achievement. Okay. No, it's not. That's not, that's not a scientific statement. There is no scientific validity to that statement whatsoever. Okay. You don't have to be studying IQ to know that. Okay. Science, now, now, you could read that sentence as considered the strongest predictor, as in society in general might have that perception. Well, that, that's true, <laughs> unfortunately. That's true. But not scientifically. And when you're saying something in a journal like this, you're, you're essentially saying, you know, this is a scientific statement, right? So that is not a scientific, uh, scientific statement. Now, why is that? Well, number one, Intelligence has no rigorous definition in science. Not a rigorous definition. It's not, it's not a, whether we're talking about a consensus of scientists saying, oh, this is obviously what it is, whether we're talking about some rigorous objective, you know, way of, of, of defining or categorizing intelligence. The human brain is the most complex object we know in the universe that we know. It's got the most pieces, the most connections, and all the telltale signs of complexity. It, there, there are cultural considerations. Uh, background experience considerations, uh, countless ways that individuals can bring themselves to bear on challenges. There's 7 million years of hominid evolution that shows us computationally what nature does to solve problems and on and on. This idea that intelligence is a defined thing and that you could therefore use it in a sentence like this, that intelligence itself is the strongest predictor for scholastic achievement. You can't say that when you can't define intelligence. Like, we're not even remotely close, remotely close to, to definitively defining a robust definition of intelligence. That's just the truth. That's not an opinion. <laughs> there's, there's just no, anyone who says that is, is you know, either lying to you or themselves and, and has a lack of understanding of how science works. Okay. So that's number one. Intelligence has no rigorous definition. So that straight off the bat is an absolutely unscientific thing to say. Number two, um, even if it did, let's say we had a, 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 an actual operative definition, like a good rigorous definition of intelligence that was robust to different types of people and different cultures and different learning styles and, and all the vagaries that you could bring in to that definition. We do not know that it's intelligence that makes one do better in school. I mean, we, we kind of take that for granted. Well, obviously, you know, you got to be, you, you know, you have to be smart. Well, let's. Remember here that schooling is an extremely contrived, man-made, invented, narrowly defined thing. It doesn't look much like anything we see in nature, much like anything that we evolved to maneuver around or study or think about or recognize patterns within. It is a very much narrowly defined, contrived thing that we have put in place institutionally right, via standardized tests to try to validate that a person is going to be prepared to, I guess, do something in the future or presumably has the knowledge needed to call themselves a professional or an expert or just knowledgeable about a given area. It is an extremely narrowed down thing. Even within that narrow setting, who's to say what makes someone good at what they do? Uh, or good at passing exams. There could be a number of different ways that you could do this. Different people from different backgrounds have different approaches. All kinds of different people graduate with degrees, you know, with, with, with their undergrads, with their masters, with their PhDs, whatever it is. Um, so you can't define intelligence one. And even if you could, saying that it's intelligence specifically that makes someone do something, as opposed to what? Their creativity, their ability to swap patterns, their ability to emotionalize something their ability to pick up on emotional cues. You could go on and on all day about the potential ways someone might bring themselves to bear on challenges. 
And and if you want to fold those into the definition of intelligence, then <laughs> now you've got such a a broad spectrum version of what intelligence is that again the whole sentence doesn't make sense. We do not know, or, or, or sorry, what we do know, because we do not know any of that. What we do know is that good test takers do well in school. Regardless of what makes them a good test taker, what we do know is that good test takers tend to do well in school. If you, if, if you can't sit down and do the examination, pass the exams, well, you're not going to pass. That is the way that you get validated in, in school and university and, and get that piece of paper. Okay. So here's what I want to be clear about. When we look at this study, it, it is a real study. I'm not saying anything is being faked here. Okay, the researchers are doing their job. They're, they're doing statistics. The statistics itself might be perfectly fine. Grossly misapplied to a phenomenon to which it doesn't belong, but the statistics in a self-contained way, in, in, in terms of following its own rules and following its own best practices, that's fine. You know, I mean, there, there's probably still some debate there, but that's not the point here. It's a real study. It's real data. It's real results. But it rests entirely on circular logic, and that's the problem. A circular argument, right, relies on premises that are as questionable as the conclusion itself. Okay? So someone is going to set up an argument, which they are. It doesn't matter that it's a scientific study, whether they're explicitly stating, you know, here's my argument. We don't tend to do that when we publish papers. But of course you're making an argument. Of course you have premises connected to, to, to a conclusion. Because the point of science is to run experiments and or come up with models, theories that are going to help build or buttress the premises that you're using to eventually draw your conclusions. That's the point. It's part of reasoning. You are doing science to be rational, to be objective about the world. So if logic isn't working in your study, nothing can save it from it. Okay. The authors of the study are defining intelligence in terms of test taking. That's what they're doing, right? Full on, because it's the IQ test that they're talking about. And scholastic achievement is wholly defined by test taking. Okay. Any correlation found in this study, 0.54 or whatever, is going to be inevitable and, and for the most part meaningless. And the reason is not because, well, the correlation isn't real. That's not the point. You can have those debates too. That's not the point that I'm talking about. Whatever correlation you find was designed into the, into the system to begin with. In fact, it's not that much different than that first scatter plot that I showed from the original poster who kind of made it himself or somebody made this by design, right? Where they, they just create essentially some synthetic data. They sample it from a known distribution. They make it fit a predefined correlation and then they show you it. So that's not real data. That's just designed to look a certain way. You know, let's say, let's say just for pedagogical purposes, right? To teach someone maybe or, or an easier way to digest the information. But if you go to look at the real study, it's not any different, right? Because you are fitting the notion of intelligence to these contrived examinations, these tests with very specific questions, <laughs> dramatically narrowing down the absolute wealth of variety that humans bring from an evolutionary standpoint to bear on problem solving. It could not possibly be captured by something as synthetic and unrealistic as an examination that you sit down to write within an institution. So any correlation is going to be found because you're baking it into the exams already and you're using circular arguments. Okay, you can't not find some kind of correlation. So the big message here is that no amount of statistics, math, probability, or anything in the scientific toolbox can validate something that isn't even logically sound or strong. If you think of a deductive argument straight from logic, right? It's valid if the premises are true. If the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. Okay, so logic is just a way, it's, it's, it's the very beginning. It's the very starting point of backing up what you're saying, scientifically or otherwise. Okay, like what I'm doing right now. I'm not just throwing random information at you and asking you to believe me. I'm trying to back up what I say. Okay, so in deductive reasoning, right? If my premises are the things I'm using to back up what I'm saying, if those are true, then the, cl uh, the conclusion must be true, if that's a valid argument, okay? So it's got good stitching. doesn't guarantee the premises are true, but at least you're attempting to make the stitching. 
between premises and conclusion. Sound argument would be a valid argument with true premises. So not only have I backed up what I'm saying and connected it to my conclusion, the way that I backed it up is, is good. It's something that we agree on. It seems to be true. Okay, that's deductive arguments. Now, inductive argument, which is more in line with what we do scientifically, we typically think of science in terms of inductive just because there's a probabilistic aspect to it. We're, you know, we're dealing with random variables. Nature is complex. It's, it's not some simplistic deterministic thing. Okay. But still essentially the same idea, connecting premises to conclusions. Okay. It's cogent. If the premises are true, the conclusion is likely, but not guaranteed. It's the same idea. It's like a weaker, softer form of a valid argument. If you are connecting this correctly, as long as those premises are essentially true for the most part, then your conclusion is essentially true for the most part. It's like a softer version of a deductive argument. Uh, it's a strong inductive argument if the premises provide strong support for the conclusion. So if you did your job, premises are probably true, then it connects to the conclusion. So anyway, why am I talking about this? Well, you know, you don't have to pick apart all the deductive inductive reasoning. This is common sense. <laughs> if you're going to put forth some type of statement, whatever it is, talking about politics, talking about why you went to that restaurant to eat something. If you want anybody to take you seriously at all, then you back up what you say. And backing up what you say means you come up with one or more premises, those beginning things that lead to the conclusion, the statement that you're making. We all do this if we're doing arguing well, debating well, even just general conversation. That's what you're expected to do. Otherwise, why would anyone listen to you? Why would anybody take you seriously? Okay. Well, this is why science runs experiments and or develops its theories. It's to support the truthness of the premises used in arguments. They're not going to speak about it in such logical terms. They're not going to say, here's my premises, here's my conclusion. But of course, that's what you're doing, because that is very much the nature of putting something forward and defending it. Okay. No matter how much evidence or statistical data is presented in a study, if a study is based on a logical fallacy, its conclusions cannot be considered reliable or valid, period. There's no way around this. Statistics cannot save you from a bad argument. Logical fallacies are errors in reasoning. You can't do science without reasoning. Okay. So let me do a really quick recap and tell me why I think this matters. Because you could say, you know, who cares, Sean? It's just one study. And not everybody, you know, some people take IQ seriously. Some people don't. What's the big deal? So I'll get to that. Oh, just a quick recap. I said at the beginning, look, we've got this plot that, that somebody on X, formerly Twitter, posted. Can you predict IQ based on grades? And then just right away, you don't even have to read the rest of it. You have this immediate circularity baked into what's being said. Because what you're saying is if someone is good at passing academic tests, then they will be good at passing academic tests. It's, it's, it is, there's no exaggeration here. That is literally what you're saying. The circularity is that complete. Uh, so yes, obviously, that, 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 that's not worth studying. That's not even interesting. It's already baked into the study. It's already designed. There's no way you're not going to find some type of correlation if you're going to believe those correlations to begin with. It's all there from the beginning. This is the problem with IQ research. It all stems from a, a deeply flawed circular argument. Okay, now that chart wasn't even from the reference. So we go to the paper and it sounds very scientific. It sounds very, you know, following statistics, best practices. And that's true. A lot of ways it is. Okay. But it's got the statement in there. Intelligence is considered as the strongest predictor of scholastic achievement. No, we don't have a rigorous scientific definition of intelligence, not even close. Science doesn't even, the, the current paradigm of science is abysmal at understanding complexity. The human brain is the most complex phenomenon that we know of. So <laughs> we do not have the scientific ability at this point to make a statement like intelligence is the strongest predictor of scholastic achievement. Social perception, sure. But this is a journal and you're supposed to not just be talking about perceptions in society. You're, you're making a statement scientific. Okay. And uh, all we can know for sure, which is really all this could be based on, is that good test takers do well in school. Okay. So it's, it's circular logic. It's flawed. It's a problem. And, and, and again, this is why you do science, because really what you're doing is you are making a logical argument. You are trying to get the truthness of the premises that can 
connect to the conclusion. So if the reasoning is not there because it's circular, it's, it's fundamentally right off the bat flawed, nothing can save it in statistics or math or probability or anything in the scientific toolbox. So why do I care? Why does this matter? Well, let's read part of the conclusion of that paper. And, and you'll see why. It says, the results of our study clearly show that intelligence has substantial influence on school grades. Okay, not IQ, not test-taking, intelligence. They're using IQ and test-taking to define intelligence, which of course is the problem. But they're using the word intelligence. They're, they're, they're implicitly baking that into the premise as though we're just supposed to take that face value. That's not scientific. Uh, and that's going to be regarded as one of the most, if not the most, influential variables in this context. It's meaningless. Okay. Um, blah, blah, blah. Eh, they talk about G. This, uh, G stands for general intelligence, and that's a whole other conversation where they essentially reify, which means to make real something that is abstract. And they use linear techniques to do it. Anyways, but you can go read my essay on this and other people's. It's, it's just a dangerous idea. Okay, so they talk about other things. Here's the point, though. Here's the point. They say, furthermore, the findings suggest that selection procedures for tertiary education, colleges, universities, and employment should incorporate intelligence tests in addition to school grades. So their conclusions are not saying test-taking skills have influence on school grades. They're not even saying IQ has influence on school grades, which would already be so problematic. They're saying intelligence has influence on school grades. And worse, this isn't just some harmless study because they recommend that the selection procedures in school and employment be influenced by their findings. So this is problematic because this is affecting so many people's lives on what is essentially pseudoscientific nonsense. We cannot measure something as complex and evolved as intelligence as intelligence by using myopically defined low dimensional synthetic highly contrived examinations that are designed to correlate what they correlate that are designed to fit the complexity of human intelligence that has been evol evolving for millions of years in uh, you know onto a bell curve uh, that that assume that if you're good at something, you're to the right of a bell curve. Nature doesn't run on a bell curve as much as the statistics community, unfortunately, would like you to think. Okay, We're not talking about adding a bunch of heights together. This is the most complex phenomenon that we know of. This is the most emergent phenomenon that we know of, human intelligence. The idea that is going to be modeled correctly on a bell curve, and worse, that you should filter society based on that bell curve. Okay? If society, if nature has come up with the full distribution of the bell curve, then it's using the entire distribution. And, and it's not even going to look like a distribution. These, these are figments of the statistical imagination that we use, sometimes correctly so, because it's our best approximation at, at anchoring studies and thinking about the phenomena that generate the data they do. Complex phenomena are not going to be modeled properly using simplistic linear techniques. Human intelligence absolutely cannot be modeled on a bell curve. And filtering society, which is what you're doing when you say it should get into the selection procedures, filtering society by saying this is who should be elevated in academia, saying this is how we should gatekeep opportunity, saying this is how we should decide if someone gets a job or not. This is not some left leaning, happy go, feel good you know, agenda to, to try to push something politically or to try to get you to think of some certain ideology it has nothing to do with that. I'm talking about science, pure, proper, objective science to which studies like this do not fall into. And if you're going to select and filter society based on this nonsense, it's not just a harmless study. It's not just a niche thing. It's a real serious issue and it, it, is, it has does and will affect many people's lives. If we're going to affect people's lives, let's at least do some proper science on it. Let's at least do some proper logic on it. If you can't even get the logic right, whatever comes after that is not going to work. 
Logic has its limitations. Logic is not the whole picture. You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because you want to sound or look scientific. All of us, whether you're talking about something scientific, you know, theological, political, socioeconomic, doesn't matter. You have to back up what you say. It has to be based on a level of reasoning. There has to be one or more premises connecting to a conclusion. And you have to do that in a valid or sound way. Okay, that's it for this episode. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, take care.